a warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today for this session two of our round one of our virtual academic program on national security strategy development in Africa. In particular, we would like to welcome our colleague from Sudan, Major General Retired Mubarak Babakar. My name again, we'll keep repeating it, is <laughs> Luca Byung Deng Kual, and I am the academic dean at the Africa Center and the faculty lead of this program on national security strategy development in Africa. Before we start our program, I just would like just to share with you for the benefits who join us and for the benefits of our panelists, some of the key takeaways from the session one. I'm sure with, you may appreciate with me that Dr. Raymond and Ms. Mrs. Michelle prov provided us with a better understanding of the challenging security environment in Africa and some key concepts and definitions that are relevant for the development of the national security strategy development. Let me share with you the key takeaway from the session, about five of them, and I will try to be very brief. And these for the benefits of who did not attend the first session. The first takeaway is a problem statement about the environment, I mean security environment of Africa. Although each country may have its own unique security situation, the security challenges in Africa are evolving and complex. And that may require a thorough diagnosis and a better understanding. A clear statement of a problem is a key pathway to finding effective solutions. What we often see in some of our countries is the dominant solution-driven approach for addressing complex challenges, and that may result in a cut and paste prescription that are often alien to the context. Addressing complex security challenges in Africa require a problem-driven approach. Second, understanding security. Although the current definition of security is centered on human security and people-centric, rather than state-centric or regime-centric approach, each country may define this concept to fit its context. Uh, this context, uh, this concept is complex with many dimensions. In the case study of Burkina Faso, as you will be hearing in the subsequent sessions, they decided to have a serious discussion about how to define their national security in the context during the consultation process. Kofi Annan, the former US Secretary General, captured the complexity of security and its relation to other sectors in his popular quote, we will not enjoy security without development, we will not enjoy development without security, and we will not enjoy either without respect for human rights. Third, the concept of a strategy. The concept of a strategy is rooted in the military doctrine and warfare with focus on how to use resources or powers of a state to achieve victory. This military-centric definition of strategy has become under increasing criticism as it is means-centric approach that inhabit, inhibits critical and strategic thinking. As mentioned by Dr. Ramon, there's a new thinking of redefining strategy as a theory of success and to shift conversation from means-centric approach to ends-centric conceptual approach to security. In relation to concept, there's issue of policy. While policy provides a vision by setting priorities and goals, a strategy is a plan of action for the implementation of the policy. What matters is not the naming of the document, but the content of the document. As some countries adopted the security policy and then developed later on security strategy or combine the two the two into one document to be known as national security strategy. Force, inclusivity and participation. There's abundance of policies and commitment and legislation of integrating gender mainstreaming or engaging the citizen 
in the formulation and implementation of public policies, including security sector. What is lacking in Africa is the political will to implement such commitments and policy. And this results in the high level of dissatisfaction and mistrust of citizens in their governments. An inclusive and participatory process in formulating public policies such as national security strategy is likely to nurture and nurture trust and satisfaction of the citizen with their government. The complexity of the evolving security challenges necessitates not only the whole of government approach, but also the whole of society approach. The, the last one takeaway is anticipated shocks, the pandemic. COVID-19 is a wake up call for rethinking the way security has been received, planned, managed, and delivered to the citizen. Despite its enormous uh, impact on human security, COVID-19 provides a golden opportunity for revisiting the existing public policies for de or developing new ones that are not only to be iterative, but also adaptive to unexpected security shocks. What do we want to achieve from this session? We are trying to achieve three things today. And I hope our panelists will be able to, to help us achieve this objective. One, to discuss the rationale and the utility of national security strategies in Africa. Second, to examine the UN, United Nations and African Union commitments to support its member state to develop the national security strategy, strategy with all stakeholders involvement, particularly women, youth, and non-state actors. And finally, to assess how national security strategy will contribute to sustainable development goals, especially goal 16, African Union Vision 2063, or an African Union challenging gun by 2030. I hope our moderator and the mod and panelists will be able to address these issues adequately. As I mentioned, the panel conversation will be for about 45 minutes and then followed by question and answer. The main reference for this program and this session is the, is the document we call the National Security Strategy, Strategy Development Toolkit. That is now available in English, French, and Arabic, and it will soon be available in Portuguese. Please refer to this document because it's the main reference uh, document. And uh, let me introduce this session will be not moderated by me. It will be moderated by my colleague, Feli Shopwe. Um, and well, you have her bio with you, but I will highlight some of relevant aspects of her experience and expertise. She is an independent expert in conflict and security with 14 years experience in research policy development and operation, especially in Africa. She is a rostered expert for the International Security Sector Advisory Team. And previously she worked as at the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance called DICAP. And this is one of the leading international agency in, in security sector reform and, 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 and policy formulation. And she holds a master's degree from Geneva Graduate Institute and doctorate from the Otto Soho Institute of Political Science in Berlin, Germany. So let me give you the floor to the, uh, to the, uh, to, to Feli, Dr. Feli. So you are welcome, Feli, to moderate the session. Thanks. Many thanks, Dr. Luca, also for the introduction. Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon, wherever you are. It's a pleasure to moderate today's panel, and I'm going to begin by introducing our panelists. Considering the subject matter for today, we could hardly have um, two better individuals to address these questions. Uh, the first panelist is Professor Metani Tadesi. He is a visiting professor at the African Leadership Center of King's College London, and really an impressive academic specialist on peace and security issues in Africa with a tremendous track record in, in uh, publishing and theory. Um, but also uh, 
a, an exemplary record of public service advising various governments in the region, but also regional and multilateral organizations. He had was drafted and developed the Horn of Africa strategy for security sector reform. He supported the AU commission in developing its policy framework on security sector reform. And he also organized and chaired the development of national security policy for the new Republic of South Sudan. So those are just a few highlights of a, of a long and beautiful career. Uh, they're especially relevant for our discussion today, I feel. And then our second panelist is uh, Dr. Abdul Fatou Musa. He's the director of the Western Africa Division for the UN Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs and Peace Operations. But that is really the only the latest appointment in a long history of service for multilateral and regional organizations. Um, he, well, having been with the UN for, for several years now, before that he served with the African Union. He was deputy head of office and director of political affairs in the UN office to the African Union, where he led on the UN strategic partnership with the African Union and regional economic communities on peace and security. He also has a long record working on peace and security mediation issues in Eastern and Southern Africa. And before that, he worked on political affairs and peace and security for ECOWAS. So there's really, I really can't imagine anyone who could better address the different levels of international and regional cooperation with regard to national security strategy development, which is what we're going to talk about today. So um, we're going to start. We have uh, three questions for each of our speakers, and um, we hope that you'll find the conversation enlightening. We hope also that you will find it thought provoking because the last 30 minutes of the session will be devoted to your questions. So um, just so that you know in advance. Professor Tadesi, beginning with you, um, we'd really like to hear about how your engagement with the African Union in formulating its defense and security policy and security sector reform policy, um, what you learned from that about the utility and the rationale for national security strategies in Africa. And then on that basis, um, how the African Union's commitment to support states plays into that dynamic. Um, and more generally and specifically with regard to security sector reform and transformation. Uh, thank you, Freli, um, uh, for that introduction and also yeah, for, for the questions. And uh, obviously, um, national security policy development process have become popularized recently in many African countries uh, and also is in the EU, mainly um, at the back of you know, the development of the uh, security sector reform uh, strategy of the African Union. Uh, so basically, the the whole concept of national security policy uh, was introduced. Even its value and and its its, its uh, relevance was introduced to the African Union parallel to the development of the common defense and security policy. But primarily after the PCRD, which is a post conflict and reconstruction and development we served as a basis for, for the AU to, 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 to mandate the commission to develop an SSR uh, framework policy. It was within that discussion, the debate around the development of the security sector reform strategy of the African Union that as, you know, the national NSP in general became one of the pillars of somehow positively influencing, you know, the behavior of the African state. So it was within such, you know, a framework uh, and, and a process that the NSP become placed in one of, you know, the most important documents of the African Union, which is the security sector reform strategy framework. Within that, obviously, uh, it's not an, a standalone chapter, even the, the, the whole issue of, uh, national security policy. It's, it's somehow housed narrowly within the requirements for, for, for SSR in many African countries. So as a requirement, it became the second in one of the most important requirements before countries engage in uh, security sector reform processes. Of course, the way countries will engage depends on the context itself whether it comes through the UN uh, Security Council or the African Union Security Council or through the request of the member state itself. But the document 
clearly stipulated that African countries need to develop a national security strategy so that SSR processes can be, you know, um, uh, materialized. So it was within that context that the debate came. And the first major requirement as put by the AU document is legal frameworks. Then secondly, national uh, security policies to guide the reform processes. So I think the linkage here is between SSR and national security policy and silencing the guns. These are the closest range of you know, connections that what one can see as the axis that really looks into national uh, security policy. It's not as such forceful mandatory, it's like a recommendation, you know. It's just like advising Afri African governments to do it. And whenever they are ready, the AU will come in to support them. Up to now, most of the support of the AU is on national, on security sector reform than specifically on uh, national security policy. But increasingly that is being recognized and being popularized. So, I mean, a lot of work needs to be done. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in terms of the work that needs to be done at the national level, what are the challenges that you see, for example, both for um, African states in the process of developing their national security strategies, but also in that for the AU in supporting them to do that? Well, one of the challenges is uh, political, I think, uh, because National security policy, I mean, the process is more important than the outcome. And in most of the national governments, most of the political processes are not either, you know, inclusive or representative and, and broad based. I think as a major requirement is the political, you know, you need a big tent, you need a broader, you know, consensus, a kind of a national, you know, covenant, you know, political covenant where different actors can come together and you know frame you know a national security policy at least the goal posts of a national security policy should be broadly agreed you know you need to have a broadly agreed you know based on consensus specific goal posts so in order to do that the political process should be in place and in most african governments that is not the case and secondly there is a gap between the AU Commission and these national processes. The African Union does not have direct linkage with national stakeholders. In fact, one of the problems of even SSR, let alone national security policy, is that the African Union Commission does not have even relationships with African parliaments, I mean, in, in kind of direct relationships. So on the one hand, there is a gap political gap within the national context, on the other hand, between the AU and, and African governments, because the AU only encourages them. It doesn't have really, you know, direct contacts or entry pointers to deal with these national uh, processes. So I think this is the way that is probably the major in fact, it has to do also with the African Union's capacity itself, by the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the SSR unit in which the national security policy strategy is really uh, somehow clearly stipulated is thinly populated, even, even the agency itself. And it was only recently itself that the national security policy became a major agenda within SSR. Even SSR itself became top of the agenda at the political leadership level. Up to now, it was institutional and technical, even with the AU itself. It was only recently, maybe after the, the last um, high-level retreat of the African Union in Djibouti in October 2019, that even SSR became top you know, of the agenda of the African Union at the level of the commission, I mean. It has never been mainstreamed into different departments of the AU, like peacekeeping, gender, you know, all of that. So unless you mainstream them, you cannot have, you know, practical implication in, in member states. So there are several challenges that need to be, you know, uh, picked from this, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Mm, thank you. Yeah. So I'm what I'm hearing from that is that the capacity challenges at, at all levels pose a stumbling block. If that puts the onus for strategy development back to the national level, um, how then can, from the national point of view, uh, the implementation of a national security strategy help to realize some of the larger frameworks in the AU context, like the AU Vision 2063 or silencing the guns in, in 2030, for example? Yes, I think what the most important point here from uh, your question is, I mean, to look at is mainly what is the value of the national security policy in terms of both SSR and the AU's agendas? Uh, mm -hmm. First, you have uh, the silencing the guns, obviously, but that one is also broadly incorporated into the agenda 2063. So peace and stability in Africa is becoming a major requirement for sustainable social and you know, economic uh, development. Now, in order to silence the guns, one of the most important statements of the AU is that security engines need to be accountable. They need to be professionalized. It doesn't really go into the details of you know, the, the governance issue, but at least it, it explains in terms of reforming and professionalizing security engines. Now, Unless you have a broader framework like national security policy, it means you don't have even a compass or a guide where to reform, why to reform, and for what end, you know? So basically, this has become really a major stumbling block. Countries without some understanding or some consensus or some coherence on a national security policy cannot reform themselves not only SSR, even political processes cannot be guided based on an overarching national framework. And unless you have that also, you cannot fit in into the agenda 263 and uh, also the silencing of the guns. So the most important thing here is that without NSP, you cannot have the compass and the guide. But not only that, NSP also provides a framework for national conversation itself. In most countries, you know, either even sometimes, you know, national conversations can be in different forms. Even sometimes violence can be a form of conversation. In order to avoid violence, you need to have forums and processes that really bring in different players into a kind of national conversation. But apart from that, there is the issue of predictability. Even in the common defense and security policy and the SSR policy of the African Union, one of the issues is to create harmonization of policies among African countries, to create transparent security doctrines, to flourish you know, good neighborly relations and, and regional integration. Unless you have somehow similar or transparent national security policies, you cannot have you know, good neighborly relations and national integration or regional integration for that matter. So NSP is at the center of everything. NSP is at the center of everything. It's about the predictability of the African state. One of the most important problems in Africa is the African state remains to be unpredictable. The only way you can ensure predictability is by having open and transparent national security policies. And that could also you know, help ensure that countries can relate to each other from a friendly and from open documents. For instance, if Ethiopia knows the national security policy of Egypt or Egypt knows the national security, long-term national security of Ethiopia then, you know, the, the, the issue of su mutual suspicion can be greatly reduced and it can lead to some kind of, you know, regional peace and security. It is through this that both the national processes and, and the continental processes can be linked. So national security policy is the most important document after the constitution. Unless you have that, you cannot really, you know, guide any political process, let alone security sector reform. And 
the implementation of the African Union security sector reform itself is based on that. By the way, the second major element that the AU mentioned national security policy development process, apart from SSR, is the operationalization of professionalization and reform of security initiatives. So in order to operationalize, not only to frame and develop SSR, but to operationalize them, you need a national security policy. But as I have said, it remains, you know, a lot of things are aspirational. The legal, the legitimacy is there. The political document is there. The commitment is there. But when it comes to practicalities, we are still, you know, beginning to go into the real issues now. So a lot of inputs, a lot of, you know, expertise, opinion, a lot of researches and a lot of processes and support should come from, from think tanks and interest groups in this regard to support both the AU and national governments, you know, frame this process, yeah. That's an extremely rich answer. Um, I'm just gonna try and recap some of the key points there. Um, seeing then national security sector strategy development and policy as really the link, the critical link in this chain between overarching regional ambitions for peace and security and stability being translated into the national context through professionalization of the security sector, the national security strategy policy serving as a compass, a guide, as you said, um, signaling good intentions in the region, peaceful intentions, stability and predictability for relationships among nations, and uh, providing a basis for a national conversation um, in a non-violent way about things that, that affect all the population. Uh, that's a wonderful summary um, of points that you've provided us. So thank you for that. Um, we're going to move on now to Dr. Musa. Um, who will also respond to similar questions from a different point of view. Um, uh, Dr. Musa, we'd love to hear about, um, from the point of view of your personal experience, as well as your experience within the UN, um, how you see uh, UN support to member states in Africa for the formulation of national security strategies and the rationale for doing some for doing so. What can the UN do um, for African states who are beginning on this this path? No, thank you very much, uh, Feli and Luca, for the introductory remarks and your uh, you know kind introduction and uh, welcome to. Uh, respected members of various national security institutions, you know, present here. It's a, it's a real pleasure uh, to have this uh, dialogue with you on uh, the national security policy, national security strategy. From the uh, UN point of view, uh, I think there are uh, a couple of things that we need to take, uh, you know, into account. One, after the traumas of the First World War and the Second World War, uh, at the core of the UN Charter is the need to prevent future wars and to uh, bring about global, uh, you know, peace and security. You know, that is uh, the initial, uh, what is the rationale, the raison d'etre of the UN's uh, intervention in, uh, national security strategy developments around the world. But having said that, uh, the UN itself did not actually go into uh, support to member states in uh, uh, developing national uh, security you know, policies until somewhere in the 1990s, when the contours of the UN uh, you know, strategic vision uh, in support of member states uh, in, uh, uh, in the development of their national security policy strategies uh, actually took shape. And I think the uh, seminal document of the UN was in uh, 2012 uh, when uh, uh, the Water General Assembly adopted the Integrated Technical Guidance Note on UN support to national security policy and their strategy making processes. You, you know, so this document uh, actually sets the tone 
uh, just last year, uh, another document came out on the UN and SSR globally, and I think uh, it will be important also for participants to have a look at that. Uh, the uh, rationale, you know, this is the rationale that I am, you know, talking about that for uh, the United Nations, um, the formulation of national security strategies allows member states to identify, you know, priority needs, uh, increases governance accountability through the social contract that we are all uh, talking about between the state and its populations. Uh, and it is very, very important in terms of, uh, uh, you know, increase in transparency and, uh, and which also fosters national reconciliation and peace building. The national security strategies we have to, uh, you know, note uh, is intrinsically political, very, very political because it touches at the core of national sovereignty, right? So uh, the policy itself or the strategy is actually a vehicle. It's a vehicle, you know, through which uh, the whole, you know, security governance uh, process takes place. What lacks, you know, uh, uh, as far as we are concerned, whether at the uh, UN, at the African Union, at the, uh, you know, ECOWAS or the other sub-regional uh, organizations is that uh, you still need to break down national security strategies and policies into national security plans. And this is where uh, the nitty gritty is. It is uh, how it is done, who does it, when it is supposed to be done, all the issues that we are talking about in national security and for whom, you know, it is done. You know, so uh, those are, you know, very key elements and that is the lacuna that we have. The UN uh, at this moment uh, has limited itself to helping countries like Burkina Faso, Liberia, after the peace agreement in 2003, uh, Burkina Faso after, uh, you know, the overthrow of President Compaore, Central African Republic, uh, you know, after the, uh, the Seleka were dri driven out of power, for example. It is about helping the countries develop their national security strategies. But uh, going down, you know, uh, to the, you know, grassroots, it is how this is done. And that is where the question of sovereignty, uh, you know, comes in and the uh, differences between whether you are actually developing a national security strategy or a regime security strategy. You know, that is very important, you know, because the, 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 the former uh, deals with a uh, all the human security issues, given the very ethnic diversity of our countries, and then you know the other inclusiveness of the you know process, uh, the the exclusionary measures that have hampered the development of a, a, a truly national uh, you know security policy in the country. So, from the UN perspective, UN does not impose national uh, security support. In fact, uh, it has to be preceded by a request by the member state. And, and you know, that also touches on the whole issue of uh, sovereignty and other. So where the UN has often had uh, space, you know, to support countries is often uh, in post-conflict environment. After civil wars and other things, where no single uh, power, no single faction, or uh, anybody is actually in control of the processes. But that has been uh, the challenge of uh, uh, the, the UN uh, national security you know, strategies. But uh, as we come along, we will give examples of where most of uh, you know, this assistance has gone to in countries emerging from conflict. Thank you so much for that. That's really... Um very useful reflections here. I think it's really um, valuable how you've put this in the context of a, of, of, of a 
national security strategy really moving from grandiose ambitions and vague ideas to the real nitty gritty of getting it done and moving towards uh, how security should be provided for the nation and for the people rather than the regime in question. Um, so I'm wondering, based on your experience and perhaps some of the UN experiences, places you mentioned like Burkina and, and Liberia and Central African Republic, um, what challenges do you see, what opportunities for creating an inclusive process, a broad-based process? And that means sort of engaging uh, women and youth and civil society actors, those parts of the population who may not usually be included in discussions around national security. What um, experiences, challenges and opportunities do you see around that? And why is it useful? Why is it desirable? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, but you know, like as I said, you know, earlier on uh, the process in developing a national, you know, security policy or strategy is as important uh, as the product, you know, itself. And in fact, the product depends on the process itself. And the process is who sits at the table? What are the core issues to be dealt with? And, you know, all that. And the UN has got a policy framework. You are talking about, uh, 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 what is it, uh, resolution uh, 1325, women, and then you have women, peace and security, which actually give uh, guidance, you know, notes and the plan for uh, women in particular to be at the table, to be active participants in the development of the national security policy. The same goes with the uh, young people and civil society, you know, groups, but it is easier said than done. You know, when you talk about women, uh, you know, women's participation, the UN's approach has been a lot through advocacy, through uh, training, you, you know, uh, of, you know, women and advocacy against barriers to their effective participation. Whether you are talking about edu the child girl uh, education, whether you are talking about customary laws, we are talking about regulatory barriers that have hindered the evolution of women's participation in our countries. Number two, when you are talking about civil society, uh, let us be very frank, governments around the world and particularly on our continent are always very suspicious of civil society. Some actually see them as enemies. You know, so we, uh, there is a lot that has to be done, you know, to convince governments, uh, you know, to understand that you can never build a national security, uh, you know, what is it, a national strategy without non-state actors. When you are talking about today, today, member states arming communities, the, 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 the whole nature of uh, intercommunal violence across the continent and other things, at the core of it is women's organization, community groups, ethnic, uh, you know, affiliations and others. And if you are not able, you know, to bring this into a national vision and also a national strategy, it is going to be a major, major problem. For the UN, uh, 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 the challenge of actually developing national, uh, helping countries develop national security strategies, and it goes also to what Medani was saying about the African Union and the other sub-regional organization. It is the question of sovereignty. We have seen examples, you know, like, uh, you know, in countries like Liberia, uh, after the, uh, the very first civil war, uh, in places like Cote d'Ivoire, in the places uh, like CAR, UN usually has space in the period uh, of the transition. The transition period in Africa post-conflict is usually about 12 months. On the average, you cannot develop, uh, what is it, a very serious national security policy and plans during this transition period where no party, uh, you know, to the conflict is in charge. And then immediately after that, we go to elections. And the elections often bring one of the parties to conflict to power. And once a, a party comes to power, 
uh, then it, it, it now the one that dictates to the UN, to the AU and others, uh, citing sovereignty. So the, the space after elections to actually support a really inclusive national uh, you know, security strategy is very, very narrow. So going forward in the opportunities, and it is also about resources, it's about how do you sequence transition, transitional processes? When does the national reconciliation processes, uh, which must also culminate in the uh, you know, national security strategy or policy, do they occur during that period of no man's is in control? or after one of the parties has come to power. That is a dilemma that uh, the, you know, all of us have to you know, resolve. But often, because of lack of resources and also the multiplicity of crises around the world, we don't have the patience actually to uh, ensure a proper transition post-conflict in most of our countries. And so uh, the national security strategy process becomes stunted and it veers more towards regime security rather than a, a policy that guarantees human security. Those are, so we've got the frameworks, which are opportunities for them. There, there are uh, real uh, advocacy with government to introduce quota systems, particularly for women. And that has happened in several uh, you know, environments in the security you know, sector process in Mali and other places that we'll talk about. So all these policies are there, all these guidelines are there, but also it is about uh, the resistance, uh, the resistance of governments, of regimes. Uh, and because of sovereignty, it is very difficult to break that down. So the greatest opportunity for support will be when nobody is actually in control and the UN and the other partners are there, you know, to make sure that the country moves from war to peace. Thank you for that. Um, in the context of um, moving from war to peace, this is one of the uh, ensuring sort of peaceful, just, accountable, inclusive societies is one of the uh, goals of um, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which the UN works under and which all states have committed to, in particular, Goal 16 um, for peaceful, just and inclusive societies. Uh, can you explain how uh, Goal 16 and the SDG framework fits with this constellation of, of uh, national security strategy development in the in context that you've just described? Okay, um, yeah, you know, if you look at the, uh, you know, goal system, and I will talk about all the 17 uh, goals of the SDGs. As you know, the SDGs are like a continuation of the uh, Millennium Development Goals because the international community could not achieve those goals by 2015. So by 2030, what the entire, uh, what is the spectrum of the sustainable development goals and join us to do is to ensure uh, inclusive uh, security and inclusive prosperity. You know, I think those two are the cardinal. And so if you look at almost all the goals of the, uh, what is this, uh, you, you know, talking about, uh, you know, goal system specifically because you are talking about uh, uh, what is the inclusive security, which is also core. But there are all others, whether it is to uh, free sanitation and other things to women, uh, goal, uh, goal five, uh, gender equality, and a whole lot of them, they all reinforce each other. S uh, some of the goals are the building block to achieve what we call the inclusive, uh, you know, what is the prosperity. So uh, when we are talking, you know, about the sustainable development goals and the regional and sub-regional organizations have got, uh, you know, corollaries. If, uh, you know, if you take, for example, the economic community of West African states, the overarching, uh, what is it, a framework for them to actually uh, develop, help countries develop, you know, that sustainable peace that we are talking about is actually the Equals Conflict Prevention Framework which also cuts through so many 
uh, you know, other components, you know, within it, whether it is governance, uh, political participation, uh, uh, you know, the same security sector governance as part of it, uh, the ECOA standby force, which is supposed to be a branch of the, uh, you know, the, the, the standby, the continental standby force from APSA and from the PCDR that uh, Medani was talking about. So it is actually uh, not uh, militarized security, okay? Uh, but it is about uh, bringing about security governance, effective security governance to ensure, uh, you know, peace and, uh, you know, stability for all, you know, communities. So uh, once again, we go to, uh, you, you know, women's participation. And in the, in the case of Africa, we are talking also about uh, how do you cut across ethnic differences? You know, because one of the threat vectors in Africa today is intercommunal violence, to which has latched, uh, you know, the terrorist attacks you know, in the region, uh, the ethnic profiling is becoming very pronounced in, you know, most of the, you know, you know countries and all that, you know, so uh, the inclusiveness, uh, you know, for me is key here. That is, you know, number one. And also, uh, you know, talking about, uh, you know, in the support for, you know, for example, you know, Mali, there is the uh, the, 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 the agreement monitoring committee, which is supposed to uh, bring about the implementation of the OGS peace agreement in Mali. In fact, women, there was zero representatives in that monitoring committee through advocacy and, uh, you know, all that by the United Nations mission, MINUSMA and others, uh, parliament adopted this uh, gender quota system where in all levels, of uh, participation, uh, women should constitute at least 30%. And within a very short period, in the monitoring committee, which is made up of 30 members from various, uh, the government and also the, uh, the uh, you know, parties to other parties to the, you know, conflict, uh, there are nine women, which is, you know, so they've already met that through advocacy and all that, and it is becoming very effective. When you are talking about today's uh, 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 what is the conf uh, conflict environment, uh, you know, in Africa, you are going to the need for community outreach, community policing, and others are key. And there is no way you are going to have an effective community intervention without uh, dealing with the ethnic divisions without dealing with uh, the uh, basic quick impact, uh, you, uh, what is it, uh, projects that will reduce, for example, the conflict between herders and farmers in many of the you know, society. And then also the young people who form the food soldiers in many of these uh, militias and others. So that outreach is very important. And in UN practices, uh, in fact, it is the police uh, you know, in particular, who are key, uh, you know, in this, or in the justice system and other things about training, uh, you know, and, you know, all that. So the police is very important. And within that component, the women's role is very, very key when you are talking about, uh, you know, community development, when you are talking about community uh, outreach, you know, in order to bring about, uh, you know, grassroots, uh, building infrastructures for peace at the local level. You know, so, uh, you know, so for me, uh, we are moving, it's important, you know, because of the conflict environment, terrorism and others, it is important to have counter-terrorism operations, but they are not an end in themselves. In order to bring, uh, you know, stability and sustainable peace, there is the need to go for dialogue, there is the need for inclusiveness, and I think this is what the SDGs, uh, you know, globally, uh, uh, you know, about uh, broadly. Thank you for that. Um, also, a really rich intervention. Um, I'm just going to pick out uh, a couple of points there. Um, the point where you've said the SDGs in, invite us to move towards a vision of security that is more inclusive because of the link to sustainable development. And indeed, maybe in this discussion, we've tended to focus 
on conflict contexts and transitional contexts. So um, Professor Tadesi noted at the beginning that um, much of the national security strategy development processes in African states have been linked to the AU's SSR framework and perhaps SSR is associated as a post-conflict agenda for change. Um, and perhaps also some of the UN's um, experience has been most linked to places that have experienced context and therefore invited international support at the moment of transition for the purposes of reconstruction. And that's very important um, to understand, but at the same time in broader contexts, perhaps not transitional, not necessarily post-conflict or conflict related, but developmental context. I'd really be grateful to hear um, from both Professor Tadesi and, and Dr. Musa, how you see the relevance of national security strategies in those non-conflict contexts. And again, from the point of view of inclusive security, because Dr. Musa, I thought you, you put it really well when, when you said that um, women and civil society are already actors in the grassroots architecture of peace and security. It's just that space has not always been made for them at the tables at the highest levels. Um, so that was, I think, a, a very good way to put it. So yeah, um, over to you, perhaps, Professor Tadesi, would you like to jump in on the, the relevance of, of national security strategy development and inclusive security in developmental contexts, non-conflict contexts? And then we'll go back to Dr. Musa. Um, well, um, national security policy is important for every context, for that matter, because like even SSR itself is not uh, only uh, limited to a post-conflict situation. Well, one of the problems, uh, probably the legacies in Africa is that uh, even the AU policy framework itself on, on SSR is, is based on a very specific document of the AU, which is not really ideal. The basis for the, the security sector reform strategy within the AU is the PCRD document, not the common defense and security policy document. I mean, the ideal document for SSR would have been, to rationalize SSR would have been the common defense and security policy, which is more, you know, broad, deep and flexible, you know, in terms of even looking at every aspect, every context, you know, uh, in terms of the normative framework. That is more highly pronounced to make the AU as a normative actor, unlike, unlike the PCRD. PCRD is mainly focused on post-conflict reconstruction. So the 2006 document of the PCRD unfortunately became you know, the guiding document for, for SSR policy. Well, at that time, many African governments were also suspicious about SSR. They were not really comfortable with reform, you know. And uh, so probably it was practical, but it was not ideal. The second doc document that should have been the guiding principle for SSR development process would have been the, the AU Convention on Democratic Elections, you know. These are well advanced normative documents. So my the problem here is the normative actorness of the AU itself was somehow limited or truncated or constrained by the fact that the heads of states took that document, the PCRD document, which guided SSR. Then SSR became considered as only a post-conflict, mm -hmm. uh, you know, undertaking. Of course, in the debates and discussions it has expanded. Well, one of the issues probably, I didn't mention it earlier, is the fact that the AU policy framework gives more emphasis in terms of SSR and national security policy on national ownership. Mm. The only way you can ensure national ownership is if national governments have their own national security policy. Because mm. National ownership, even according to the AU document, states that external support for SSR will adhere to a nationally defined vision. Look, a nationally defined vision of security and security sector reform, consistent with nationally defined goals and objectives. 
how can you have national defined goals and objectives without having at least a broader understanding on national security policy and strategy? And the problem at the heart of the discussion, the debate in Africa here about nationally defined vision is whose security is implied in that vision. Yeah. And this brings us to the issue of the process, you know, who is involved, you know, mm. ordinary citizens or external hand or, you know, few defense or, you know, intelligence chiefs, you know, and, and the elites. So whose security is implied in that vision? If the vision is the base for national ownership and the vision should be based on a broadly discussed and approved national security policy. Like SSR, NSP is important even for institutional renewal, even for the UK or for the US, let alone for many African countries. So it's not limited to post-conflict context. In fact, it's much more important than that. And as I have said, you know, the whole issue of promoting mutual trust and confidence among African states is based on the fact that at least most of the processes of SSR and national security policy are important to every context in Africa. So both at the EU level and at the national level, uh, this, not need, this need to be really highly emphasized and, and underscored. Thank you for clarifying that for us, Professor. Dr. Musa, would you like yeah, to- yeah, yeah. Thank you very it? much. I think uh, we are talking about uh, non, you know, conflict settings, uh, you know, countries that are nominally at peace. And I don't know how many countries today on the continent are even nominally at peace. So I think uh, threat uh, analysis, you know, the, 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 the perception of threat in the country is a very strong advocacy tool. If you look at how Boko Haram emerged in Nigeria, if you look at, uh, you know, how, uh, the, you know, in Somalia, a lot of it, a lot of it has to do with exclusionary measures and using uh, military uh, you know, solutions to, uh, instead of dialogue, in order to bring about a common understanding. And it is very ironic that today, most countries, Mali, Nigeria, in Somalia, they have opened the door for dialogue with uh, the so-called jihadist groups, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, Boko Haram and other. That teaches us uh, you know, a real lesson, you know, so I think that and the threat environment today is that no country on the continent is insular, you know, which is also very important that your security is as strong as the security of the neighborhood. You know, that is also very important as a driving factor in so-called countries that are nominally at peace. That is number two. Number three, the advocacy had to go towards uh, this message that uh, security, human security, and even the security of the nation does not depend upon strong men. It depends on strong and accountable institutions. You know, I think that is it. The transparency, accountability of the justice system, of the security forces, of uh, parliaments, of the executive uh, of uh, independent commission, human rights and other things. The more they are inclusive, transparent, and actually are uh, building blocks for strengthening the social contract between the state and the people, the more your security is guaranteed. If not, you are only postponing crisis, you know, in, the, you know, in this country. So I think, uh, it is very important to convince policymakers in all countries that uh, exclusionary measures and the emphasis on uh, maintaining power is only transient, and that it is very important that all layers of society are at the table in discussing 
what are their threats. In fact, the threat analysis for many people in the peripheries in our country is not even terrorism. It is common drinking water, portable water, shelter, education for you know uh, children. And once we are not able you know, to create opportunities for young people who today form the food soldiers for criminal gangs in the transnational organized crime rackets, uh, in a jihadist movement, they are the same food soldiers in, uh, you know, what is it, uh, in intercommunal violence that we are seeing. And once we do not fight uh, hate speech, you know, uh, you know, based on ethnic profiling and others to bring about a harmonious, uh, what is it, a vision of a, a country, a nation, a country belonging to all. Um, uh, no matter how you build a national security strategy outside these parameters, it is going to be transient. I think it is important. So strong, transparent institutions and not strong individuals.